Um, yeah, okay, so may as well, uh, okay, we'll get this going. Uh, hi, welcome to the ODI Friday lunchtime lecture. Um, I'm Fitton O'Donnell. Uh, thanks to those who came along, you know, take time out from their lunch or whatever to watch this live stream. And um, today we uh, are lucky enough to have Andy Dudfield. He's the head of product at Full Fact, who are an uh, independent fact-checking um, charity. And so Andy will be talking today about why or how bad information can harm lives and what a web of good information might mean. Um, we'll have uh, questions and discussion afterwards. And so if you have any questions, then just enter them into the chat. And um, yeah, that's about it from, that's about it from me. Uh, Andy, if you want to, uh, you can start whenever you want. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, Fintan, can, uh, can you see the slides, Fintan? I need to ask that as a starter. Excellent, brilliant stuff. So, hi everybody. Um, thank you for coming along to a lunchtime talk um, on a subject that I care about uh, quite a lot. Um, so, quickly, a little introduction to me. Um, I'm Andy Dudfield. I've worked at Full Fact um, for about uh, just over a year now. Um, my job title is uh, head of automated fact checking and sometimes head of product depending which one I remember to update my um, email address uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Mr underscore Dudders where I talk about a lot of the themes I'm going to be discussing today good data and the like and also um, probably low league football and cycling so you know just make sure you're kind of aware of that before you get fully involved in everything um, and today I'm talking about an organization called Full Fact um, so Full Fact, as Vincent mentioned, are an independent fact-checking organization. And we've been going for about 10 years. Uh, we celebrated our 10th birthday um, over the summer. And we are sort of uh, an organization that is here to address bad information. Um, we do that via fact-checking, but we do that also via everything that fits around fact-checking. So we want to use our fact-checks as a body of information. Um, but we also think about where we want to campaign for change that we need to see in society and through systems, the way we need to communicate with people, and the way that we need to use technology. Um, and the technology part of this will be where I'm talking mostly about this time, but we really believe that bad information can ruin lives. And I think that's a really important starting point for any conversation about fact checking and bad information. Um, Bad information and fact checking can sometimes be seen as a sort of almost a trivial topic. People talk about things like fake news and memes that go viral. And sure, that's part of what makes the web, but also bad information can really promote hate. It can damage people's health and it can hurt democracy. Over the last few years, we've seen a few interventions from bad information that has really, really serious consequences. The largest outbreak of measles, um, in, Amer in recent times in America is through misinformation that was spread on WhatsApp. Uh, we've seen in Nigeria um, horrific misinformation spread where conjunctivitis, really curable disease, has been suggested as being cured by battery acid with understandably horrific consequences. And more recently within coronavirus times we've seen an absolute cavalcade of misinformation and we've seen some very unfortunate things particularly um, in the Middle East with the suggestion of using meat alcohol as a cure for coronavirus with pretty devastating consequences. I say that not to bring everybody down but I say that because this is the foundational stuff we're, we're talking about here. Bad information has absolutely serious consequences and our work is about addressing that. Um, and I'm here to talk about how our work uses technology to address that. Full Fact as an organization is about 30 strong, which means that we're one of the largest fact checking organizations in the world. We're also very lucky to have five strong technical team within that, which again is one of the largest technology teams that we have addressing misinformation. Um, I think it's really important that Full Fact were fact checkers first and then decided to see how they could use technology to help um, that means we are, to an extent, our own users. We felt the pain of all of the things we're trying to alleviate with technology. We're not arriving thinking technology is some magic solution. We're here because we've identified things where we feel that technology can make a real difference. Um, and my world is really divided into three things that I'm trying to do. 
The first is to help identify the right things to fact check. There are an awful lot more things said in the world than we have the ability to fact check and that funneling, that triaging of all of the information we can possibly fact check down to the most important information is something the technology is quite good at supporting. Taking a mishmash of, um, of information that's quite messy and starting to filter it through to understand who said what about what is a, is a good use of technology. And if it, we've also um, re more recently really started to develop our work using artificial intelligence in this space. So we've been using um, the BERT model, uh, a Google open source model, to develop a model specifically to detect claim-like statements. So we've trained that on data that's been collected from fact checkers um, with several thousand annotations. And we've developed this model that can process um, information that we get from transcripts of TV, radio, social media, and from scraping websites, process that down sentence by sentence to um, look through what is there, and then uses this model to identify statements that appear to be claims. And then within those claims, we will classify them into smaller sections. So we're under, we can classify where people are making predictions, a much harder area to fact check. And we can identify where people are using quantities to make assertions, which tends to be a much easier area to fact check. So that triaging process of breaking down information, identifying what to fact check is really important. We're using AI for that. And we're also using um, entity work, semantic work. So we can use great rich data from things like Wikidata to identify who somebody is, and then also to identify all the instances of that person. So we can see that Boris Johnson, Mr. Johnson, the Prime Minister, they're all the same person, and we can group those things together using good, hopefully useful web technologies. Once we've then identified an important thing to fact check, another part of that technology is to try and ensure that fact checks can be done as quickly as possible. Um, and it's really important here, I think, to say that we're not automating the process of fact checking. I don't believe technology has progressed far enough to be able to do that, but technology is a really useful foundation to help and support the process of fact checking. We can do things like transcribe live audio and live um, TV, and we can also try and identify where people are making statements that use uh, data sources that we know and trust, like official statistics or government record, and where that information is available in a machine readable way via an API or an open machine readable format, we can take that information and we can bring that in so that a fact checker has that to hand as they're doing the fact checking process, which is particularly important if we're doing something like fact checking Prime Minister's Question Time or a live TV debate where we have lots of information that we want to be able to process as quickly as possible. Um, and we're also really interested in understanding where we've seen repeats of things that were previously fact checked. Um, this is important for us as a fact checker because we don't believe that just publishing a fact check is the thing that's going to make the biggest difference. Publishing a fact check is important, but we always want to be able to follow up on that, ask somebody to correct the record, take an action based on the fact check that we've undertaken. And so where we're finding repeats of misinformation, it means we're able to ask more people to correct the record or to make a change. And also it helps us understand the vectors of misinformation. Things move around in lots of different ways. And so we can start to see the ebb and flow of misinformation. We can see what might be seasonal, what might be weekly, what might be annual, or some claims which are almost zombie-like. They keep on repeating. We see them time and time again. And that understanding of the information landscape allows us to take better actions be that on individual claims or to think about any systems we might want to change as well. So the, 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 the detail and the big picture are important and our technology is a really good way of leading us into that so that we can start to see the most important things to be working on. And I suppose my worry with this at the moment is that we have this web of messy information um, which is quite hard for us to work with. It's quite hard for us to process identifying all the information from all these different websites that we're working with where everybody's got lots of JavaScript and lots of adverts overloaded on top of things where it's quite difficult to get the information that we want. We pull things out. We undertake a fact check. We publish that and then we just add that alongside all of that noise and all of that mess. And I think what I want to spend some time talking about here 
is how we can take that information and how we can make it travel further, have a greater consequence, and hopefully be more additive to improving this web that we all want to use. Um, and I say that um, because the web is amazing. The web is this beautiful thing that we have. It's this mass of all of the information that humanity has. Over half of the people in the world have access to pretty much everything everybody's ever said about anything. It's an extraordinary resource that we have. And I think it's something that's upon all of us to think about how can, how can we contribute to that? How can we make sure that that is the best thing that it can be? Because I think we have an opportunity here. We have this moment in time when we're working with something that's really transformative. And I see that it, there's a consequence from our work. Everybody who's working in technology needs to think about, is their work making the web be the best that it can be? And I think that fact checks are a really important part of that. Um, and I think one of the ways that they are an important part of that and a way that's really developing is because we can structure a fact check as a piece of information that's very specifically defined as a fact check. As part of the schema.org project that's run out of several technology companies, I think um, Yahoo, Yandex and Google were involved in its creation, um, have suggested these different ways that we can describe information. We see that online when we see things like um, film reviews or where we see um, the knowledge graph and Google search results. We have different information called out in different ways where um, people who are taking information can understand that the specificity of different things need to be treated in different ways. And as part of that schema project, which I think is one of the most transformative and important parts of the web over the last few years, there's um, a component there called claim review, which is a way of describing a specific claim and a conclusion that's attributed to it. And to me, that's a really powerful thing because it's starting to say that a fact check can be defined as a piece of information that is different. Um, that's not to say that a fact check is some sort of single point of truth. A fact check, when it's at its very best, is a collection of information that allows a person who's reading it to understand some working out, to understand the information that sat behind it and be able to come to their own conclusion. But the information is presented in a consistent way and addresses the specificity of a single claim. So someone said something in a place at a time and that information has been reviewed and here is a conclusion. Um, and I think that's really, really important to us because that means that we can think about how do our fact checks travel further into the web. And that means at the moment, through some information that Google share, for example, that hundreds of millions of people are seeing fact checks. And that's really exciting because fact checkers around the world are very small and have very little resource. But by using a transport mechanism like claim review is seen by hundreds of millions of people. And that starts to mean that we can do something really interesting. That starts to mean we can take this idea of this messy web, this idea of a fact check, and then we can start to think about how do we weave that fact check into the fabric of the web? How do we ensure that when producing it, it can be seen by the right people and can be appearing in the correct ways as well? So how do we ensure that a fact check can be friction within a system? So it's all very well publishing something on a single website. People coming to a fact checking website can see that and consume it. But how do we get it to appear in, intermediated into the right experience where someone's about to share that information on a social media platform where they're reading a news article about that topic? How can we ensure that that information is there? And then how can we start to join it together with other things? So I think that's something that sits with a, a fact checker at the moment about how can we ensure that we're describing who we're fact checking, what the topic is, what the conclusion is in such a way that other people can take that information and build and do interesting things with it as this underlying kind of layer of good information that I believe can exist within the web. And I think that idea of uh, addressing bad information uh, as I was talking about at the start of this is very much why we need good information. And one of the projects I'm really lucky to be working on at the moment is a collaboration between Full Fact and the Open Data Institute and two other fact-checking organizations, Africa Check, who are based across four nations in Africa, and Checkiado, which are the brilliantly titled Argentinian fact-checkers. And we're working to um, do a project to look at what the publishing of good information for fact-checkers might look like. And a lot of this results around things like official statistics. How can we ensure that we publish official statistics correctly using the right formats and the right descriptions so that it becomes easier 
the fact checkers to bring this information in. Um, and I think that's really exciting to think about how do we use good information to make sure that fact checkers can easily and reliably find the right information so that fact checks can then be published with that right information contained within it in such a way that we can think about how do we weave that into the web. And uh, we're at the starts of this project and we are interviewing people around the world at the moment. And I think it's, it's interesting to see the varying qualities of statistical systems that we are looking at and the different levels of interaction or um, uh, ways that we can help to improve that system. And that, that can be from, it would be nice if your PDF wasn't actually a scan of a document, right up to, it would be nice if your machine readable data had this extra serialization on top of it. And what I'm really keen to do and something that we'll be talking about much more in publicly is making sure that we develop a toolkit for the right information that we can make available to fact checkers around the world, statistical institutes, governments who are producing data around the world and say, everybody always has one thing they can do to make the way that they're producing information and data online slightly better. And I think I'm really keen to ensure that we have that as an outcome of the project, just a way for everybody to just try and always do one thing to make the publishing of information better. And within that, there are a couple of things that I'm really interested in at the moment around the quality of information. Um, and that's basically how do we ensure that the information that we're using within fact checks particularly can be described in the best possible way. And there are a few things to me that really stand out as needing further work. Um, one is around context and caveats. So when you're publishing information around a fact check, which has specificities for a specific piece of information, how can you ensure that context and those caveats are applied to it in a way that when people are consuming this information away from your website through an API or through a different third party system, that context needs to travel. So if someone is citing some statistics, are they the correct statistics for that? Are they time bound in some way? Um, and these things become really important. Um, for example, if I wanted to talk about um, the rise or fall of inequality in society, I could make a fairly persuasive case um, for that both things were happening, but I'd be using two different sets of statistics to do so. I could do similar things with crime data about whether I'm talking about police recorded crime or public perceptions of crime. The context is really important. The caveats that sit with that are really important. Did a methodology change in the statistics? Did something else happen outside of um, normality that meant that this information could be weaponized or used in a different way? Um, and thinking about how we can ensure that we can keep that context traveling with the information and often through weapons of themselves, uh, from networks themselves that can be seen as weaponized, how can we ensure that this stuff transparently moves? And also that's where provenance comes in as well. How can we ensure that we can always link back to the original sources of things? Um, these, are, these are problems that the web has grappled with time and time again, but I don't think we've managed to get right. And also I don't think it should be too hard. And I really want to kind of have this as a call, I suppose, a request that anybody who's interested in these areas, interested in thinking about how data can be used to its best and about how this information can be described in a way where context and meaning of that information travels with it wherever it is used i would love to talk to you i would love to collaborate with you because i think this stuff is really foundational and i think that it's the want of just some people getting together and saying this is the best way that we can do it or maybe they already have and i don't know about it but this stuff feels really powerful and finally um the identifiers within this as well feel really important to me so making sure that when we're talking about our fact checks, that um, a consideration is given about how do we connect these to the worlds of others? Should I be using a DDpedia ID, a Wikidata ID to describe the person that's contained within a fact check? How can I ensure that it's the person talking about what somebody else said that somebody else might have said? There's chaining and complexity, but what can I do to make fact checks more meaningful and more useful to more people? because we've got this great transport format in claim review as part of the schema project but i feel there's more that we can do and i really want to make the case for the fact that this is really important to making the web be what it could be um so in conclusion 
Full fact are a fact-checking organization that have been around for a while and we've identified that technology can help us deal with the scale of what an internet era fact-checking organization needs to be. We're using AI, hopefully appropriately, to help us with the processes of triaging misinformation so that we can find the right things to fact-check. When we're fact-checking, we need access to high-quality information. Some of it exists, but we want there to be more. And we're currently working on a project with other fact-checkers in the ODI to work out how we can articulate what the good in that instance looks like. And I'm interested, when we're publishing our fact-checks, that what metadata can be contained within them to make them be the most useful thing they can be. I think the metadata we're describing in our fact checks is our love letter to the future, our future selves. It's us describing this stuff in the best possible way because ultimately at some point we're going to want to use this and we're going to thank the previous version of ourselves who's had that diligence of describing this stuff in the best possible way and so we know when and when it, when it can be used and when it can't be used. And I think this stuff is something that we all need to consider. And I really want to find the right people to work with to make this be the best possible thing that it can. Um, I'm going to uh, drop off screen share in a second, but my email address is andrew.dudfield at fullfact.org. If you want to formally um, talk to me in any way, my Twitter handle was at the start of this. I'm fairly easy to find online. Please come and talk to me. And um, thank you for your time. um great thanks very much andy uh yeah uh, very interesting um so i have a question myself but i'll you know i'll, I'll take um, uh, other questions first and if, I, if there's time for mine then i'll throw it at the end but um so the first question here is uh how do you how do you find how and where information has spread are you using like say something like plagiarism detection or how do you how do you know what's out there um so at the moment we're doing a few different things. Um, so part of this is um, previously we've used quite simple techniques, but really powerful techniques to um, do effectively search based things. So claims are quite specific. They have a piece of context. So we can search for repetitions of that within media and then we can graph that. So we can see that people are talking about certain pieces of information over periods of time. It's hard because the networks of propagation of misinformation are not universally well known. Sometimes that's within closed networks as well, so it's much harder to say how is information spreading on WhatsApp, somewhere that we you know, really would expect misinformation to be spreading, how is it sp spreading on social networks, and how is it spreading on the wider web. So we um, do the best we can with the information that is available to us. Um, and on top of that, we're doing some work with um, developing a, a different AI model at the moment to be able to paraphrase um, misinformation. So we're looking to be able to say, okay, this claim was very specifically described in a certain way, but what other ways could this, what other terminology could someone use to make the same statement? And that widening of our ability to identify these things, not just that specific statement someone said, but other statements that mean the same thing that we can identify through um, of what is actually, again, a BERT-based model means that we're starting to develop a more nuanced understanding of what how things are spreading but it's a really really hard problem and one of the most important things in fact checking um yeah so the next question here is kind of trying to understand the i guess the fact checking space and maybe different organizations in it and so it's, um so the question here it's like uh, what's the difference between full fact and snopes when you know what do full fact do that Snopes don't do and vice versa? Uh, or even you're to differentiate or say how the fact checking landscape plays out amongst different organizations. Sure. I mean, I don't think I've, I mean, I've got what 20 minutes here. I mean, this, this could be my kind of like two hour answer at this point. Fact checking <laughs> is a wonderfully complex, nuanced and brilliant world. Um, there are a couple of hundred fact checkers around the world. Uh, full facts remit is we consider ourselves to be the UK's independent fact checker. And what we are fact checking tends to be the things that are in UK discourse. Um, and that is a good distinction because it means it gives us an understanding of where we're looking to, to have the greatest impact and the things that we can look at. 
also the world of online misinformation is obviously not um, great at adhering to international borders. So that doesn't mean that we wouldn't check something that could originated somewhere else if we felt that it was having an impact in the UK. Um, our world is very much around the specificity of claims um, um, that we feel that have potential for harm. And harm can mean lots of different things, but that harm to de democratic systems or harm because of um, misinformation could endanger life. And that's where we tend to focus. Different fact checkers or people in the misinformation space will do different things, ranging from taking a look at the most viral um, misinformation um, down to very, very specific things that are particular to those in power and we'll be looking at a much smaller group of people that are holding to account. I think the fact that it's a wide spectrum is great and each fact checking organization has a different way of defining that. There is an organization called the IFCN, the International Fact Checking Network, that has a code of principles of what um, being an independent fact checker is. Um, that's related also to the way that these organizations are funded to prove that they are um, politically neutral as well and I think their code of principles is well worth a look. And thanks. And so I guess the next question is kind of, it's an interesting question around like almost fact check design and users. And so like who, who are currently from full facts understanding who's the, the top users, if you can use the fact check uh, for your fact checks and who do you wish would use them more? Um, so I think our audience is something that we're constantly trying to understand. We know that we have, um, without trying to sound too boastful because I'm very bad at boasting, like a reasonable following on social media and that we try and kind of have an influence within um, discourse. But I think the group of people who come to a fact-checking website or consume stuff through our own channels is always going to be smaller than the group of people who might want to con um, be aware of the things that we're fact-checking, who might not be aware of fact-checking organisations or us specifically or the fact that we've covered a claim. And I think the audiences that are more interested in thinking about how do we reach are the people who are consuming the misinformation and kind of also where they are consuming the misinformation. So that idea of adding grit into the system, that idea of um, making it harder to spread misinformation by bringing the fact checks into the other ecosystems is partly why I'm so interested in the idea of making sure that our fact checks travel far through open standards. But I think it's also profoundly important in making sure that the audience who most need the fact check receive it at the point that is of most benefit to them. Um, and there's a few here from um, it's, uh, Pauline Roach and this, this, this question, it almost sounds like a plant, but it's not from us. And it's, uh, does open data help you do better fact checking? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, and uh, thank you, Pauline, for asking that. I suspect, uh, yes, it does. Um, open data really, really helps with the process of fact checking. Um, having the right information available, clearly described, so that we know when and when we can't use it in such a way that we can bring it into the systems that we're using to help fact checkers is really foundational and fundamental to what we want to do. I think having official government information and statistics available in open formats and um, particularly machine readable open formats to be honest so like the higher kind of order stuff really helps the speed um, that we can fact check and really helps us ensure that we're using the best possible information that we can and there is always further ground to cover I think we're lucky to an extent in, in the UK that we have a good healthy statistical system across the work of ONS and the wider government statistical service. Um, but everybody can think about how they improve the information that they have. And I think coronavirus has been a really strong example of that, where we've seen really rapid evolutions of the way that people are publishing information. And I, I think that has to be welcomed that people are trying to do the best, um, get the right information out as quickly as they can and iterate on it. But it shows that these kind of things can be done um, I think some of the work that particularly ONS have done in setting up entire new surveys really, really quickly has been transformative. Um, but making sure that stuff is published quickly as possible in open formats that can be used by everybody is also absolutely essential. Um, there are two more here from Pauline. Maybe I'll ask them as a combo. First is... Um, uh, 
is there are there like fact checking is there fact checking on conference and maybe like how do fact checkers like I assume there's a community and how do they get together and what are the best ways they share information between each other and um, next one's maybe about what does full fact say about Facebook I guess you could also say does it is it too big a topic or whatever or are they would you even have certain opinions about certain social media organizations uh, in terms of the ability to fight misinformation? Excellent. Uh, thank you. So uh, how do fact checkers get together? So the uh, International Fact Checking Network is useful because it is a network of fact checkers and that is a kind of formalized process a lot of the time for how we um, get together and also for the uh, nerdily involved um, global facts my word what a conference um, is the place where all the fact checkers get together um, unfortunately virtual this year for understandable reasons but yeah that's there are a, there's a sort of a suite of networks of the way that this stuff happens um, uh, relationship with Facebook um, full fact receive part of our funding from Facebook um, and that's to work on a program that Facebook have called the third party fact checking um, PPFT, the third party fact checking network. And that's um, uh, in part, we fact check information that is surfaced up on Facebook. Um, it's a really interesting program and I'd recommend taking a look at the work that they're doing. Um, and also I think taking a look at the work that Facebook are continuing to evolve about how fact checks surface up within Facebook. And I think it's an interesting example of the, the thing I was describing previously of how do we ensure that, as sometimes happens in Facebook, if you try and share something that has been fact checked, that you are prompted or informed that you might want to consider this. Um, I think that's quite a, a powerful example of that. Um, but also, um, I'd recommend reading, um, going to the Full Fact website and taking a look at some of the reports we have published as well. Um, about some of our deeper sort of policy considerations around our connections with social networks. Um, well, um, this might not entirely apply. Uh, it was about what was your favorite thing to fact check? Um, I guess given you're the head of automated fact checking. Um, yeah, anything particularly, you could even just say something particularly about in your work that's your favorite thing or your favorite thing that your work has have helped lead to fact check. Um, so I think it's it's always gratifying to see our work being used. I was pleased this week to see um, our tools being used in Nigeria, South Africa and Kenya um, and to address and identify the right things to fact check by um, staff in um, fact checkers across those countries and that that feels like fact checking working well where if we're producing things that we can share and allow other people to use then good things are happening. Um, and I was also really pleased um, last week where we used um, some information from one of the uh, coronavirus dashboards which have been made available in a machine readable way to feed into our fact checking process really quickly so we took some nice information from that and were able to surface up um, a good insight into whether something was uh, being used correctly or not within a speech um, almost in real time and that that's a really powerful leap when we can start to use technology to have that kind of stuff happening that quickly um, within um, information is, is is really exciting. Um, the question is, keep coming, keep coming, Andy. Um, so it, uh, how do you define success with fact checking and um, how would you measure impact? Um, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and I think one that we're constantly having to evolve and understand what that means. Um, I think when the fact checking has come a long way in 10 years, um, and one of the, I think, really kind of important sort of second or third way things that's happened within fact checking is this idea that fact checking doesn't start and stop with publishing a fact check. The idea that there is an intervention and action and a follow on from publishing the fact check. And that can mean a multitude of different things. I have no sort of really succinct answer for this, but asking someone to correct the record is really important developing um, connections to those who are um, spreading the misinformation to identify if it's um, something that was inadvertent or if it was part of a pattern, working out ultimately up to thinking about what would need to change in policy or legislation to better um, uh, ensure that it's harder to spread this bad information. 
those things are all success and require at times a single fact check, an amalgamation of fact check, or years worth of expertise and understanding of a topic. And I think it, the important thing for the work that Fallback is doing is that we see ourselves as trying to work across a wide spectrum of that and really address impact in lots of different ways. Um, next one is on a topic I guess all of us need to consider, but it is how do you mitigate against bias in your fact checking or discuss your potential bias internally? And have you uh, also have you ever avoided something because it felt too subjective? Um, I mean, so these are these are the great questions, everybody, uh, <laughs> um, and also not easy questions. So kind of good and bad, I suppose. Um, so bias, I think there's, there's two points. So on that one, very quickly, um, one is um, bias within technology systems and AI. And it's one of the things that I guess is I try to keep front and center at all times is everything that we are using technology to help with is trained on a set of data. Um, and we need to consider whether that at all times is the right information and giving it the best possible chance of doing the right things. Um, and that's really something that I try and remain cognizant of and think about within the process. Um, and also, very importantly, again, why we're always human in the loop on everything. There's never any fully automated systems because we want to ensure that one of our incredibly talented fact checkers will be able to take a look at something before it goes any further. Um, and then bias within our own system, we, we always have to be thinking about these things. We are um, have to think about where our funding comes from to ensure that we are always um, as neutral as we can be. We have to think about um, our process and our governance. So we have uh, we're really lucky to have a board of trustees that sit across us as charity that from a wide range of the political spectrum. Um, and that's really helpful for us to try and keep us on the straight and narrow. And then also within our day-to-day -day work, it's a, re it's a thing we're mindful of, but it also can't be the thing that stops us doing everything. It's not, okay, we need to divvy up and make sure that we've done five of those and five of those. We need to, it's more nuanced than that. But yeah, it's, it's something that we all need to be aware of and we all need to just ensure that we're not bringing any of our own preconceptions to things. Fact checking is ultimately about saying here is a claim here is the way that we have fact checked it and here's all of our working out and we're saying that here is our best intentions but also here is all of the information that sits behind it to allow whoever's consuming it to say okay right i can do this as well i can i can see that it's come to the same conclusion that you do um yeah the next question is very interesting because i guess a lot of the time you'd be trying to trying to fact check things that are potentially in the news or the, a hot topic at a time, but you know, everything is always a, a moment in time and you know, uh, new information can come. So the question is with very quickly evolving events like COVID where the science is developing at a very rapid pace uh, and it's currently in focus. Um, how do you manage the public slash media perception of the science quote unquote changing if you have to update slash alter fact checks as time goes on? Um, I think that's a, that's a really, really salient and important question. And I think that really talks to some of the stuff that I was mentioning from the sort of the nerdy end, I suppose, about context and caveats about how do you ensure that something that could be true at a particular point of time may not be true in the future. So part of that is about time limiting things. Part of that is about making sure that we update fact checks as feels appropriate. And part of that is recognizing that we're particularly at the moment, we're in a world of very, very rapid change. Um, and it's a, not just a question of something being um, sort of talked about now and in a few years time will be talked about in a very different way. It's rapidly, rapidly moving. And I think we, we do our best with this, but also we're, we're like everybody else, we're going through things that people haven't gone through before. And so really interested to hear any thoughts or feedback of whether we've done that well or not it's you know it's a very very difficult thing to get right um yeah would you ever imagine like with fact checks and the kind of data model or how they like would you imagine you know versioning possibly or edit histories much like having wikipedia pages or something like that is that anything or that could be built in or have you thought about that or I think it's um 
uh, so time limiting is something that is kind of built into the into the model. So the idea that you can have a kind of a, effectively a use by date for the information, and I think that's that's good. Um, but also that's much more useful when you know about a change. So they can an electoral cycle or a piece of legislation that could change things at the moment where it's more complicated. It's hard, but um, I am again nerdily interested in how do you make that stuff part of the the fabric of the fact check what is the right way of showing the changes um, we put that in the human readable variant that's on the html on our website and that works for people who are consuming it there but what's the equivalent when other people are having it So uh, next one is uh, have you ever like uh, next <laughs> don't, don't worry they keep going uh, the uh, have you ever considered something like a maybe uh, a full fact browser extension and something for social media apps uh, you know a full fact Clippy uh, the <laughs> a good old Clippy back in the day uh, no no just a, joke, just a joke but yeah have you ever considered something like that that could pop in over content that you're currently viewing on any social media or on a web page. So it's an idea that comes up quite a lot. And I think it's one that I'm, I guess, reasonably, reasonably skeptical of at the moment because identifying repetitions of misinformation is really hard um, because the different ways that people can phrase things means that uh, technology is, is a difficult area to say this is the same as this. So having one of those things would mean at the moment that very seldom would it pop up and so people would have this oh most of the time it does it would be a false positive so you know, that's that will be a poor experience um and also because of the the things i've been describing a few times here but the the context and the caveat of the idea of something being yes no right wrong kind of these binary things is often it's complicated and it's nuanced and it's difficult and finding a way to say that any kind of browser extension can explain the complexity of the claim and the system that sits behind it with the le correct level of specificity so it appears against the right claim means that you've probably got half a page worth of information that's going to appear every time and that's that's a complicated thing to get right um yeah i guess the next is kind of again about time and you know especially these days like new cycles can be six hours if you're lucky even and uh but back checks can take a long time and mm. as they should even like a week longer uh, so how do you kind of balance that need for speed versus need for thoroughness i guess um it's a it's a constant trade-off i mean i think um i'll be careful about how much i say with this because i, I hope it's clear that i am not a fact checker i'm the person who makes the technology that sits around the fact checks but yeah making sure that our information is salient and beyond the kind of the micro news cycle is an important part of the way that we commission content um but it's this is consider it to be very very well trained journalists doing good work is the people who are making those choices and i think that's exactly where it should be um i guess this is kind of a question from joy aston is related to the question earlier it's like uh, do you involve groups who are more vulnerable to misinformation or more likely to be exposed to it uh, in deciding what to fact check? So, I mean, it's, it's again, it's part of the process is thinking about who the impact of um, what to fact check and what the outcome of the fact check is likely to be. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nuanced thing. And I think that is as an area of academic research, if nothing else, is continuing to evolve about what is the right way of addressing things. Um, for example, what is the right point to intervene on a kind of a viral hoax thing? When do you give it credibility by become by fact checking something versus just saying that's you know, that's too off to the left field, so we're not going to get involved in that? Those choices inherently are uh, the part of uh, how to decide what to fact check as well. And it's it's without wishing to seem trite. It's really difficult and it's very complicated. Um, there was a kind of follow-up question about is the model published, but I don't know whether that's the model in say the AI system or it's the model, the data model around the fact check. But while I um, guess that's, that's sorry, go on. Yeah, the, the data model is so it's on the schema org site and it's uh, the claim review um, 
and I think the time is modeled across lots of different sections of that as well so take a look there um, yeah that's the right place to try and find all of that yeah cool um that'll be all that's probably that's all the questions so I finally have time and I'll probably wrap up with my own question and I guess it's about claim review um it uh, I guess probably all know that like standards are kind of like a, often a compromise of a thousand opinions and often a thousand, a thousand strong opinions as well. Um, but with claim review uh, for yourselves in your own work, do you see maybe limits to it or what are some, like what are kind of things you need to add on or where are there, is there extra information in that standard that you would like to add into, uh, into fact checking claim review, claim reviews you store? Um, so I think, I mean, again, I mean, that's a question that is not the good one for the last question because I could answer that for a long time. But yes, I think there's loads. I think the more information we can have to describe when it's appropriate to use a fact check and when not, you know, where it should be used, what the any of the kind of clues about the fact that it's complicated, it's good to think about what the machine readable kind of versions of that could be. And I'm also interested in um, how it can be extended to think about describing um, media as well. So in a world where we're seeing um, manipulated images or videos that are edited, and I'm not talking about things like deep fakes, which we seldom see in the UK, to be honest, but what we do see is videos that are quite crudely edited. So it's things appear, uh, appear in a different order to which actually happened or have been slowed down or sped up. A way of being able to describe that there is a piece of manipulated media um, that the claim is about. So there's a real piece of media, some manipulation, a claim, there's a kind of an ecosystem of stuff that fits together quite neatly there. Um, but for me, the really important part of that is it all hangs from a claim, because the claim is the thing that's being made about a piece of media and being able to work out how you can best model and describe that is really interesting to me. Uh, thanks. Um, I get, there, there is one last one, but it was kind of uh, talked about earlier. So maybe you could just uh, mention the reference again. Uh, it's just about how Facebook big companies um, go about doing fact checking. But you said there are reference. There's uh, stuff you have that is currently out there that kind of reviews that, and just to say how would someone find that. Yeah, so I think I mean, it's it's difficult. I mean, all the different organisations work in different ways, have different levels of moderation across different platforms, um, and it's a huge topic. Um, full fact, I've got some policy stuff that you can take a look about how some of our thoughts on this, but um, in general, it changes by platform and it changes quite rapidly um, and is an area that I think it's... Yeah. I have thoughts and views on, but I think it's something that is too wide ranging and big to get into in the next couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, that is, that's about it, Andy. Um, thank you uh, very much for doing this. Um, but you had an open data institute audience. So this is, this was going to happen. You're going to get high quality, tough questions like that. Um, yeah, but it was great. Uh, really informative and um, yeah, just, uh, thanks to everyone else uh, who contributed questions and then anyone who uh, took time out of their day to listen to this. So um, thanks very much and hope to see you at the next uh, lunchtime lecture. Thank you.